Hey guys, it's Sandro here, and welcome to part two of the detail on this amazing 1967 Pontiac Firebird. Now hopefully you've seen part one, as I'm gonna jump straight into part two by doing a test section to see what compound and pad is gonna work best to restore the paint in the least aggressive manner. So using my Showmate 15mm DA polisher, my starting point was using a medium compound in the form of Shell Concepts S20 Black on a light cutting foam pad in the form of the Lake Country Blue HDO pad. I set my machine speed to around four and a half and working a section about six to eight times the size of my pad, I used moderate pressure and a slowish arm speed doing three to four passes. After assessing the severe paint defects that you guys saw in part one, I knew that a fine polish and pad was just pointless to try as even if the paint is extremely soft, it would still need at least a medium compound and an intermediate pad combination to remove those quite substantial body shop sanding defects at bare minimum. I also know that a lot of you guys like seeing all the different combinations of compounds and pads during this paint correction testing phase, and I really like sharing that info with you guys. But as I mentioned in part one, I was already way behind on this job. So I went with this combination as a starting point because it generally works extremely well whilst also being a non-aggressive combination. In all honesty, I still had significant doubts that this light to moderate combination and technique would be aggressive enough to remove the defects. But it's still extremely important to always start with the least aggressive method that has the potential to work. And although this was unlikely to remove all the defects, it was still quite possible if the paint was soft enough. Now having a look at the results, I'll start by saying that I was a little shocked. I'd say that at least 95% of the defects were instantly eliminated, if not more, with perhaps just a few of the deeper scratches remaining. But I also immediately noticed some wiping swirls that I created by just removing the compound, which is never a good sign. And although the gloss and clarity was also greatly improved, I could still see a tiny bit of haze in the finish that my combination created. So without even having to think about it, it was crystal clear that this was an extremely soft and sensitive paint. Generally this combination and technique finishes perfectly on both hard to medium paints, and you'd only get haze in the finish if it is a softer paint. Additionally, unless it's a very soft paint, there's just no way this combination would remove those defects so easily. So this was just a perfect example why it's important to not always jump to using heavier compounds and pads, even if the defects are quite significant, because you'd just be removing way more clear coat than is necessary. Now believe it or not, as bad as the bonnet was, it was actually the best finished panel on the entire car with the least amount of defects. So it was important for me to also test this combination on some of the deeper sanding scratches the body shop had left all over the other panels. There was a nice cluster of what looked to be at least 12 to 1500 grit sanding marks, along with some deeper pigtail scratches on the boot lid. So using the same combination and technique, I did another test here to see how it would work on those deeper defects. Looking at the results, I was yet again extremely shocked. As in my head I thought, there's no way this combination is going to remove the deeper sanding scratches and pigtails, but I was dead wrong. Now although there still was a few deeper remaining scratches, it was at least 90% plus defect free after just a single set of passes with such a relatively light combination, which is just crazy based on my previous experience with these defects. 
So given all the potential issues and restrictions with this paint that I covered in part one, this was really more than sufficient in my mind and a massive improvement. But if need be, I can certainly do a second set of passes in some areas that do have more severe defects. And I'd much rather do that than just use a heavier, more aggressive combination all over the paint that just makes this whole process more risky and needlessly removes excess paint in areas that just don't require it. Just to be completely sure that this combination and technique would work well on all the panels and defects, I did do a third test over some more deeper sanding scratches. And as you'll hopefully see, it once again achieved a good 95% defect free finish, which is generally my goal. I think I did this third test mostly because I was still in shock that the sanding scratches were coming out so easily. So I just wanted that extra confirmation, which I certainly got. And just for some of you guys who may be a little newer to paint correction, it's just not normal for deeper sanding scratches to come out so easily. So don't expect this in most cases. Sanding scratches usually require a lot more time and aggression to remove. So it just reaffirms just how crazy soft this paint is in order for that to happen. And the greater challenge may be finishing well and trying to avoid marring this finish. So being satisfied that Shell S20 and the blue HDO foam pad is going to give me the level of defect removal I'm after, I compounded off a section of the bonnet to then test a finishing combination to see if I could get better gloss and clarity levels in the finish. I'll also add here that I got in some new microfiber cloths as my older cloths were just leaving too many wiping scratches in the finish. And as I've mentioned in the past, good and quality plush cloths can be a lifesaver when working on these softer paints. Additionally, I also stopped using an IPA wipe straight after compounding the panel while it was still warm, but rather waited until the panel cooled down, which can also help reduce wiping swells. And I lastly grabbed some new polishing pads that always help finish better on softer paints. So these are just some things you can do to help improve your results when working on soft and sensitive paints as we need all the help we can get when faced with these paints. The first combination I tried as my second finishing stage was NV Finesse Polish on the Lake Country Orange HDO pad. When I'm struggling with finishing well on paint, this has by far been my go-to combination. So rather than testing out some other possibilities, I went straight to it as I was pressed for time. As far as technique goes, I used a similar machine speed with light to moderate pressure, doing three slowish passes in total. I was struggling to capture the results clearly on camera, so I turned off the overhead lights so you guys could hopefully see the results a little better in the footage. The finish here was really amazing and much, much better. All the haze from the previous compounding stage was gone, and the black paint just became blacker and richer with fantastic gloss and saturation levels, so we just couldn't have been more happy. Now I did have to baby this paint in making sure my wipe off was extremely gentle to avoid wiping swells, but it seemed to be a winner, which based on my limited time was fantastic to get straight off the bat. So with all of that sorted out, I set out to complete this monster sized bonnet using my two stage combination, 
Firstly, with my smaller 1, 2 and 3 inch polishers and pads for the more intricate areas and edge work and then my larger polisher for the larger, flatter areas. I guess I should also mention that Lake Country don't make 1 and 2 inch versions of their foam HDO pads, which is basically why I'm using the Rippers pads on those machines instead. But you could also use the larger Rippers pads instead with similar results in most cases, but I just personally like the Lake Country ones a touch better and would love to see them make 1 and 2 inch versions. I'll mostly let the footage do the talking here, but I'll be straight up in saying that I spent more than half the day just on this bonnet. As massive as it is, it's not a flat and easy panel to work on at all. It's full of curves, crevices, sharp body lines, badges, air scoops, and even a taco. So there's only a few sections where you can actually use a large polisher effectively, and most of it requires smaller polishers and pads if you do want to get that higher end result. And I'll be equally honest in saying that I had to go over a few sections more than once, especially around the taco that had some really deep sanding scratches right up against those edges that were no easy task to remove and did require some changes with my machines, pads and technique to get the results I was after. I just had to accept that there was no real consistency here as far as the body shop defects go. It was just all over the place, which basically meant that my approach had to have that same flexibility. Add to that the light delicate touch needed to prevent marring the paint and removing the older caked on compound in the edges. And I think you can imagine the amount of labor that went into just this one panel alone.
Now the bonnet was by no means perfect once I was done and definitely still had a few deeper scratches here and there and even some little paint solvent pops in the finish. And although I spent way more time on this panel than I should have, it's really the centerpiece of the whole car and what draws you into the vehicle. So I still think it was worth it and just had to be done to this level. You guys can obviously judge the results for yourselves, but what you will hopefully see is just a complete turnaround of the bonnet with not only 95% plus of the defects removed, but also such a richer and liquidy looking finish having amazing gloss and reflective qualities that I just couldn't have been more happy with. I know I've been mostly pointing out all the defects in the finish of this brand new paint job because it's pretty bad and that's what I'm working to correct. But it would be wrong not to also point out that the painter has done some things really well. The consistency of the way the paint has been laid down as well as sanded back to remove almost all the orange peel is actually really good. As is the consistency of the edge to edge finish with no dodgy tape line marks or blends which isn't something that's typical with cheaper paint jobs. So there's definitely many signs of a skilled painter in the preparation and application of the paint and I don't want to dismiss or overlook that. It's just plain and simple the way it's been finished with all the sanding marks, compound residue, overspray, holograms and scratches that lets down and basically hides the fact that beneath all that mess is actually a pretty decent paint job just waiting to be allowed to shine as it should. And it's just a real shame because there would have been hundreds of hours going into the bodywork, dismantling, prepping, painting, sanding and reassembling the panels only to let all that work suffer by not spending a fraction of that time to get the finish looking reasonable. And the fact that I was able to get such an amazing finish supports the fact that the paint job itself is actually quite good. The only thing as far as the paint itself I'd criticise apart from the finish is its extreme softness which I'd suspect is at least partly due to the excess body filler and just too much thickness between the bare metal panels and the top clear coat layer.
Now, while I continue to correct the paint, I want to discuss a few more things that may be helpful to some of you guys out there. I'm not using a lot of masking tape in this job for several reasons. Firstly, as I mentioned earlier, I just don't feel comfortable using masking tape on panels that have such high thickness readings. Maybe there won't be an issue, but I'm not going to test that out and just keep it to a minimum. Secondly, I already noticed that the masking tape residue is causing swirls when I wipe that section down due to the paint being so soft and sensitive. So I also want to avoid that. And thirdly, there's already a lot of compound residue in and around all the trims and panel edges from the body shop. So masking that residue will just be keeping it in place. I'm much better off just living with the fact that it's going to get into some of those areas and dealing with it during my wipe off to remove both my own residue and the previous compounding residue at the same time. So I'm just adjusting the way I work on this specific car based on the specific circumstances. The truth is that if I was making these videos 10 or 20 years ago, you guys would have seen a lot more issues and failures on my part because I've learned so much in the last couple of decades by making mistakes, not understanding certain things and not managing my risks as well. When you pull up a piece of tape and remove the paint along with it, it's a gut-wrenching feeling that you never want to experience again, so you learn a good lesson. When you remove a car badge and a chunk of paint and body filler comes off with it, you also learn a valuable lesson that you never want repeated. And when you try to remove deeper scratches on sharp body lines or edges, only to burn through the paint, it's also something that just feels devastatingly bad, so you just don't want to feel that again. It's failures that teach you the best lessons in life, and I've made all those mistakes in the past and more. But it hasn't stopped me from detailing or doing what I love, and it never will. What it has done is allow me to be better at what I do, and understand risk versus reward, and how to better manage those dilemmas. I'll always try to provide as much helpful and useful information in these videos as I can, but the fact is that nothing compares to first-hand experience and lessons, as they are what's really going to shape you as not only a detailer, but as a person.
So let's talk a little more about pain correction method and technique. What you'll see in the footage is me using my smaller 1, 2 and 3 inch rotary and DA polishers far more than my larger 5 inch polisher. The reason for this is that it's simply impossible to achieve a higher end result and eliminate scratches and defects right up in those tight areas with a full size polisher and pad, no matter how skilled you are. Now it doesn't mean that you can't improve those areas with larger polishers, but it's also a lot more risky having a large pad rotating at high speeds in those tight intricate areas where it's just simply easier to burn or damage the paint and trims. I also get a lot of questions asking how can I save time during paint correction but still be safe and achieve a higher end result. But the truth is that there's no way of getting around the fact that working respectfully and going for something closer to perfection is simply time consuming no matter how long you've been doing this. But I guess I would say that on this job I was able to save time by focusing purely on the paint and not addressing other areas like the glass, wheels and metal trims like I usually do. And that was just a judgement call here I had to make based on my limited time and where I believed it would be best spent. Make no mistake about it guys, every detailing job I've ever done has some sort of compromise to it. Or I'd literally be working on the same car for months and months and obviously go broke and mostly insane in the process. The advice I would give to newcomers in the industry is to pursue whatever level of detailing appeals to you most and don't let anyone tell you what you can, can't, should or shouldn't do. There's work in all areas and levels of detailing if you're willing to work hard, have some patience and make some good decisions along the way. But I would also generally say that higher end detailing really isn't the best place to start and certainly not where I started at all. Just like all trades and crafts, there's a vital learning curve which requires time, knowledge and experience to help you progress and I honestly want you guys entering the industry to succeed rather than be overwhelmed by tackling work that you may be fantastic at in a few years but maybe not quite ready for on day one. There can certainly be a great personal reward in producing work that you're really proud of and passionate about, but also understand that higher end work brings with it increased levels of risk and stress that I want you guys to be ready for if that's the path you wish to walk down. I also want to be equally honest in explaining that higher end work doesn't mean higher pay or income. It just means spending more time on each car rather than less time on more cars. So don't fall into the trap of thinking it's necessarily more profitable, as in many cases, due to the increased issues that you'll come across, it can definitely be more problematic and certainly less profitable when things don't go according to plan. So all I'm saying is that money shouldn't be a deciding factor here in determining which direction you decide to go in.
Okay guys, so it's once again getting to that time where I'll have to wrap up this video. So how much time did I spend in this paint correction process? It was a good 40 hours, and yes I know, that's still a lot of time. But hopefully you can see in the footage just how much work was needed to restore this paint, just how big and intricate the panels on this car are, and just how bad it was to start with. So 40 hours was actually pretty good in my book given those circumstances and given another 40 or even more hours, I could have definitely gone much further with the paint and had more time to polish up the rims, glass and trims and even give the engine bay and interior a good once over. So this could have easily been another 100 hour detail if time and money wasn't as much of a constraint. We'll obviously have a look at the finished results in part three, but I hope you guys can see just what a dramatic difference and improvement was achieved and just how important it is to get this final paint correction process right. As the best paint job in the world means nothing if the refinement and finish looks like it's been hacked by feral cats. If you enjoyed this video and would like to say thanks and help support future content, you can do so by buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com ccad, which I'll have a link to in the description box. And thank you everyone for the support so far, it's hugely appreciated. I really hope you guys stay tuned for part 3 and the final chapter of the detail on this 1967 Pontiac Firebird, where I'll be protecting and sealing the finish and showing you guys the final finish results. As always, I really hope you guys enjoyed and found this video useful. Please share this video, like, comment and subscribe to this channel to show your support for this content and I'll see you guys soon.